Good afternoon. Uh, I'm John Carter with the Nebraska State Historical Society, and I want to uh, welcome you all to the next in our uh, long line of brown bag series and the last in our special series dealing with civil liberties and civil rights. Um, we would like to thank very much uh, the people that helped make this possible. Uh, the uh, Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation uh, covers the costs of uh, videotaping this so that we can take the important stories about Nebraska and share them with literally thousands of people outside this auditorium. We're also uh, uh, very grateful to the Nebraska Humanities Council, uh, the Woods Charitable Fund, and the Cooper Foundation, all of whom uh, provided substantial found, uh, funding for not only the exhibit but all of the programming that we've been doing. We really are grateful for that. And I'd also like to thank the Lincoln Journal Star, who've been uh, wonderful in helping us get the word out. It's, it's very important. Uh, today our speaker is Jim Hewitt. Uh, Jim is a lawyer, but don't hold that against him. Uh, he practiced for a long time, was president of the State Bar Association. And when he stepped out of active practice, he stepped into the classroom, uh, returning to the University of Nebraska uh, to earn a PhD in history. And uh, for a time thereafter, taught at Wesleyan and is currently teaching uh, at the University of Nebraska. So he has not maintained a dull life. Um, <laughs> importantly, uh, Jim is the author of a wonderful book, uh, Slipping Backwards, uh, A History of the, Supreme, of the Nebraska Supreme Court, and it's an astonishingly interesting book. And his talk today is going to come from that book, and I felt was incredibly important because the uh, presentations we've done up to now have talked about uh, decisions that have been made. And those decisions all sound like they come from disembodied spirits, that uh, uh, they get handed down from some place that is not really attached to a human being. And one of the things that I found fascinating uh, about Jim's book is the fact that he talks about uh, the people that make those decisions as real, living, breathing human beings. Uh, I'd like to introduce to you my good friend, Jim Hewitt. Thank you very much, John. It's, it's uh, a little frightening to be up here and see some of my good friends from the practice of law and some of my good friends from the history faculty at the University of Nebraska and people that I've worked with in a variety of ways. And I, I do ask that if I make any mistakes that you consider to be particularly egregious, please wait until afterwards. Don't stand and throw things at me. I'm too old to dodge. I'm really very pleased to be here and to be a part of this series. Uh, actually, I was one of the midwives, I think, of this series. Uh, about two years ago, John Carter and I met in a coffee shop just down the street, and John told me what he had in mind as far as this series was concerned and asked my opinion about civil rights and civil liberties. And it was very interesting. Uh, John has been a good friend for a long time, and he comes from a long and distinguished legal family. His, his grandfather, Edward Carter, served longer on the Supreme Court of Nebraska than any other individual, and he was the youngest man ever to take a seat on the Nebraska Supreme Court, and those records probably aren't going to be beaten. It's sort of like Joe DiMaggio's 56-game hitting streak. Uh, there are just some things that aren't going to change. And then... In the summer of 1949, uh, I came down from Hastings to Cornhusker Boys State, and John's dad, Ed Carter, was my counselor at, uh, at Boys State. He was very gracious, very kind, and continued to be uh, after I got out of uh, college and uh, law school and, and ran into him a couple of times in the courtroom. Uh, I remember one instance in which he trounced me rather substantially, but I don't hold that, didn't hold that against him or against John. <laughs> but uh, in any event, we talked about the series, and we talked about the, the displays that are out in the lobby, which I hope you have seen, and if not, I certainly would encourage you to take a look at them. And we talked about the difference, if any, between civil rights and civil liberties, and I wasn't really very clear as to whether there was a difference. So. 
In preparation for this talk, I went back and looked at Webster's new uh, universal unabridged dictionary. It defines right as a just and fair claim to anything, anything whatever, power, privilege, etc. I didn't know the dictionary used etc., but apparently they do. Power, privilege, etc., that belongs to a person by law, nature, or tradition. Liberty is defined as the sum of rights and exemptions possessed in common by the people of a community or state, freedom from any form of arbitrary control. So I think for the purposes of this discussion, I will treat civil rights and civil liberties as being virtually synonymous. And I plan to talk about how the Nebraska courts, uh, in addition to the federal courts, uh, both the state and federal courts in Nebraska have dealt with civil rights and liberties and uh, what they've had to say. I think, and I, I say so in my book, I think they've done a good job. Uh, they've made some mistakes. Uh, everybody, everybody makes mistakes and courts are just like everybody else. But I'm a fan of the judicial system. Uh, it's a whole lot better than trial by combat. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, some of the ancient uh, uh, determinations of guilt or innocence uh, when you would put some poor boob into a big tub of water and if he drowned he was obviously innocent and if he came up he was guilty, uh, that's not my bag. I like to see the, the judicial system work and I think it does a good job. I think the judges, both state and federal here in Nebraska, um, have done a very good job. They're good people and they're trying hard to, to come across uh, all of these issues very, very well. We hear a lot about activist judges. I'm sure you've heard politicians talk about activist judges. Those are basically people who decide cases uh, that are opposed to the way the politician thinks they should have been decided. But um, in my judgment, the only activist judges that can exist, really, are judges who are on courts of final, final hearing. Uh, the Supreme Court of Nebraska or the Supreme Court of the United States um, are, are very final in their judgments. Uh, I think Robert Jackson, who was a justice of the United States Supreme Court, said, we are not final because we are infallible. We are infallible. <laughs> because we are final. They have the last word and they make the decisions and when they get something that is new before them, they bring their own thoughts, their own philosophies to bear on it and sometimes it's very good and sometimes it's not so good. But that's the way the system works. How did the courts get the job of protecting our rights and liberties in the first place? The basic and overarching document that is applicable to both state and federal courts is the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution was drafted in 1787. It was amended for the first time in 1789 when the first ten amendments known as the Bill of Rights were added to the Constitution uh, in order to keep faith with promises that had been made during the ratification debates. The passage of the Constitution was not a sure thing. And after it was drafted, it was submitted to the states for ratification. Nine states had to ratify, and there were some very, very close decisions as to whether the Constitution would be ratified or not. And in the course of those debates, people said, you know, we really need something in here about rights. We need to talk about rights. And so we ultimately had the Bill of Rights. Nothing in the Constitution says who is going to interpret it who, or who determines what it means. But that task was arrogated to the Supreme Court by John Marshall in the first really meaningful Chief Justice. There were two others who served for very, very minuscule periods of time. But John Marshall was the first meaningful Chief Justice of the United States. And in 1803, in a case entitled Marbury versus Madison, he made the decision that the court would interpret the Constitution, and it has stayed with the court ever since. Many presidents, many governors have not been very enthralled by some of the decisions of the Supreme Court, 
and uh, legislators and governors haven't been very enthralled, but the job has stayed with the courts. The protection of rights and liberties stems from the Constitution, but it also stems from legislative enactments, statutes, and from the interpretation of those statutes. As I say, when the Constitution was originally drafted, it did not protect any specific rights. It set up a government of limited powers. And what the Constitution in its original articles really says is this is what the president does, this is what the Congress does, this is what the judiciary does. It said uh, that, that uh, in, in Article 6 it says the Constitution is the supreme law of the land and judges everywhere are bound by it. But the Constitution really didn't spell out any rights in the original document. Indeed, it recognized a, a terrible infringement of rights in the institution of slavery, which was protected by the original draft of the Constitution. But the states said, as they considered ratifying the Constitution, we need to have some rights. And so James Madison, who was probably the principal drafter of the Constitution, said, all right, I'll come up with some amendments. And he did. He, in the first legislative session in 1789, after the Constitution was ratified, Madison drafted 17 amendments. A committee on style said, well, we only like 12 of them. And they only submitted those 12 to the states for ratification. And the states failed to ratify the first two amendments that Madison had drafted. So the great First Amendment, which we all talk about, that gives us free speech, gives us free press, gives us the right to assemble and pro protest to the government, uh, that says we won't have any state-established religion, uh, the First Amendment would have been the Third Amendment. So I'm very pleased, actually, that they threw out the first two amendments. Yeah, who wants to talk about Third Amendment rights? I mean, let's talk about the First <laughs> Amendment rights. So I think that's a good thing. The Bill of Rights, when it was originally drafted, was applicable only to the federal government. Uh, it did not govern the states. And the states, I'm sorry to say, uh, in many instances, deprived individuals of their rights and liberties, especially in cases involving criminal activity. So, in 1925, the Supreme Court of the United States, in a case entitled Gitlow versus New York, adopted the doctrine of incorporation, saying that parts of the Bill of Rights were incorporated into the Due Process Clause, which is in Section 1 of the 14th Amendment, which is one of the three Civil War amendments. The 13th, 14th, and 15th the amendments were drafted either during or after the Civil War to take care of slavery, to take care of all kinds of various rights, and to take care of the opportunity for uh, African Americans to vote. The court has continued on the course of incorporation, and by now, almost all of the Bill of Rights, with the exception of some somewhat procedural matters, have been incorporated into the 14th Amendment and are applicable as far as the states are concerned. And because of the Supremacy Clause in Article 6 of the original Constitution, uh, the Supreme Court of the United States is the final word, the final arbiter on what is going on as far as the, the Constitution is concerned. So, after, I, I hope this has not totally bored you as far as constitutional history is concerned. That's one of the problems of having historians. We like to talk about history. But uh, in any event, uh, let's look at several momentous cases that have been involved uh, and, and decided by both state and federal courts here in Nebraska. And then after we've considered those, I'll, uh, I'll turn to my book and tell you some of the things that I think are noteworthy as far as the court, uh, the Nebraska court producing uh, protection is concerned. The first case I'd like to talk to you about is Standing Bear, and I think almost all of you know a great deal about Standing Bear. Uh, Standing Bear was a Ponca chief. Uh, the poor Poncas were treated very, very badly by the United States. They were 
uh, shunted back and forth. Their reservations were taken away from them. Then they got more property up in South Dakota. And then in the Treaty of Fort Laramie, the government took that property away from them and gave it, gave it to the Sioux. And the poor Ponca were then sent to Oklahoma, uh, very much against their wishes. They didn't want to go. They didn't like all the heat. They didn't like the activity in, in, Ares, or in Oklahoma. And on the way to Oklahoma, Standing Bear's daughter died and was buried in, in a little area out near Milford. And when they got to Oklahoma, it, people got ill. It was very difficult. Standing Bear's son died. And Standing Bear had made a promise to his son before the son died that he would bring his body back and bury it in the traditional lands of the Ponca near the headwaters or the, uh, the uh, place where the um, Niobrara flows into the Missouri. So they came back. They walked, walked from Oklahoma, carrying the bones of, of Standing Bear's son. The Indian agent notified the federal government that these people had left the reservation. General George Crook, who was headquartered at Fort Omaha in Omaha as head of the Department of the Platte, was charged with the responsibility of arresting Standing Bear, and he did. Crook had engaged in Indian fights. He chased Indians. He, he was involved very briefly just before the Battle of the Little Bighorn, got beat pretty badly, withdrew, and some people think that that may have been one of the reasons that Custer and his people were not successful in the Battle of the Little Bighorn. But in any event, Crook enjoyed the opportunity to learn more about Indians, and he was sympathetic to their plight. He thought they'd been given a really bad deal by the government of the United States, and I think that most observers who look at it dispassionately feel that that, in fact, was the case. So Crook decided he couldn't do anything. I mean, you, you as a military officer, I, I can still remember when I was a military officer and I was never a general or anything close to it, you didn't want to disregard or disobey the orders that came down to you from on high. So Crook said, I'm not going to mess with it, but he went to see Thomas Tibbles, who lived in Omaha and was an editor of the Omaha World Herald. And he said to Tibbles, this guy is really getting a bum deal. See what you can do to help him. Tibbles enlisted the aid of two very prominent Omaha lawyers, John Webster and A.J. Poppleton. Webster and Poppleton agreed that they would defend Standing Bear pro bono, without cost. They have been lauded by virtually everyone who understands what happened in the Standing Bear case. Both of them have streets named for them in Omaha. I've always considered that to be one of the highest honors that you can get. I have tried diligently to talk to friends of mine who are developers and said, you know, I'll do almost anything if you would name a street after me. But uh, thus far, it has not been successful. If there are anybody, if there's anybody out there in the television audience that wants to develop something and would like to name a street after me, I'll be happy to trade a copy of my book for <laughs> for having the street named in my honor. Well, in any event, Webster and Poppleton filed in district court, federal district court in Omaha before Judge Elmer Dundee, a writ of habeas corpus. Habeas corpus is a writ that says, produce the body. It makes the government show why they are holding someone. And he, they filed the writ and the government came forward and said, you can't do this. Standing Bear has no standing, no position to file a writ of habeas corpus because only citizens can come forward in federal court and file some sort of an action. I'm sure you've read or heard on many instances or you've seen the ETV presentation of Standing Bear in which Standing Bear made this tremendously eloquent presentation to, to Judge Dundee, he held out his hand. He said, I'm a man. He said, if I cut my hand, the blood from my hand will be as red as the blood if you were to cut your hand. Dundee was, I think, essentially sympathetic to the Indians to begin with. And I think Standing Bear's presentation, which was presented through an interpreter, uh, certainly impressed him. 
in any event, he dismissed without much, much concern the position in the government that Standing Bear couldn't bring the suit because he was not a citizen. Uh, and he wasn't a citizen at that time. Um, most Indians in the United States didn't become citizens until 1924. There were instances of, of some citizenship prior to that time, but in any event, he said, no dice. It, there's nothing in the statute that says you have to be a citizen to bring the action. It talks about persons. Standing Bear is clearly a person. Standing Bear wins and the government loses, and Standing Bear was able to go to stay free and to bury the bones of his child. If you haven't seen the documentary that NET has done, uh, I would certainly encourage you to look at it or try and get hold of a copy. I think that there was quite a bit of, of movement at the time we were considering what was going to be on the Nebraska Quarter to put Standing Bear rather than Chimney Rock on the Nebraska Quarter as a symbol of how Nebraskans revere the rule of law. The second case was very interesting. It was Thayer against Boyd. It grew out of the very hotly contested election of 1890 in Nebraska. John Thayer, who was a Civil War veteran, he'd been a general, he fought very bravely at Vicksburg, was not running for re-election. There were three candidates in the race. John Powers of Trenton, who was a very active populist, was the populist candidate. James Boyd of Omaha, who was the mayor of Omaha, uh, was the Democratic candidate, and a man named Richards from Fremont was the Republican candidate. He was a banker in Fremont. They had, they had the election. Boyd barely edged Powers, and Fremont, the Fremont banker, Richards, finished well behind both of them. Can you believe that? A Republican? finishing third in an election in Nebraska, but that's what happened. In any event, there were some problems about the election. Prohibition was on the ballot in 1890, and Omaha, which always reported first in the state of Nebraska, did not return its vote until the morning after the election. Omaha had over 50 breweries. It had a large Democratic populace. They were very very much opposed to prohibition. And it was really very interesting to see what happened because Omaha came in, came in on the morning after the election showing 23,000 votes against prohibition and it needed 22,000 votes to beat prohibition. So some people, I, I, you know, occasionally historians are cynical, some people uh, who have studied that think that perhaps there was a little chicanery afoot. In any event, uh, Thayer refused to surrender the office of governor to Boyd. And because he was a former general, he called out the state militia to protect him in office. The lieutenant general, whose name was Michael John, said, you can't do that, and sent the state militia home. And so finally, finally, Thayer gave up the office and Boyd took the office, but Thayer was not through. Thayer filed a lawsuit, a writ of quo warranto in the Nebraska Supreme Court, seeking to oust Boyd because Boyd was not a citizen of the United States. Boyd's father had come to America from Ireland in the 1840s, and he brought Boyd with him. Boyd was a minor child. The father took out nationalization papers in the late 1840s, but he failed to carry them through to fruition. He finally learned of his error. I'm sure his son said, oh my God, I'm running for governor. You've got to be a citizen. Uh, his, he finally went ahead and got his citizenship in 1890, but the naturalization of the father had no impact on Boyd because it does not, uh, the naturalization of a parent does not affect major children who've reached their age of majority. Well, Boyd said, or Thayer said, you can't be the governor because you have to be a citizen of the United States to be uh, a governor under the Nebraska Constitution. The Nebraska court heard arguments in March of 1891, and on May 5th, they issued an opinion by a two to one majority, and, and Nebraska now has seven members of its Supreme Court, but in those days, uh, and until 1908, we only had three. Uh, the court said Boyd is not a citizen of the United States, 
and they ordered Thayer restored to the office of governor because no successor had ever been duly uh, qualified and elected. Boyd gave up the seat. Uh, Thayer resumed the governorship. Boyd went down to the Lincoln Hotel and told everybody that showed up that he was going to appeal a case to the Supreme Court of the United States, and his lawyers thought he had an excellent case. And his lawyers were quite prescient because he did appeal to the Supreme Court of the United States. And the next year, the Supreme Court of the United States held that Boyd was a citizen of the United States, and therefore he should be restored to office. Thayer gave up the office. Boyd became the governor for about a year, and then Lorenzo Crowns took over as governor. The Supreme Court of the United States gave the 14th Amendment a very broad reading. The 14th Amendment says, essentially, all persons born or naturalized in the U.S. are citizens of the U.S. and the state in which they reside. Boyd was neither. He was not born in the United States, nor was he ever naturalized. The court said because he was a citizen of the state of Nebraska. At the time Nebraska became a member of the Union in 1867, he became a citizen of the United States. Well, so be it. The third case I'd like to tell you a little bit about is Meyer against Nebraska, which arose out of the anti-German hysteria in World War I. World War I was not a propitious time for civil rights and liberties in Nebraska. Germans were the largest immigrant group in Nebraska. Many of them had friends and relatives in Germany. Many of them were not at all supportive of the entry of the United States into World War I in April of 1917. Governor Keith Neville created a state council of defense to assist the war effort, and they did so with a vengeance. The U.S. Committee on Public Information was churning out lots and lots of propaganda, assailing German culture, and the Nebraska Defense Council took the bait very, very willingly. The Defense Council alleged that many Lutheran clergymen in Nebraska were not patriotic because they were Germans. They requested all public and parochial schools to refrain from teaching foreign language. There were over 240 parochial schools in Nebraska. They pressured German language newspapers, and there were over 70 of them, to try to stop publication during the war. The Board of Regents of the University of Nebraska was pressured to act on complaints that many of the professors were opposed to the war. I'm not sure that opposing the war would be, if that, that's grounds for getting rid of, of uh, professors, uh, it seems to me to run counter to any notions of academic freedom, but in any event, the board held, held hearings which sort of resembled a star chamber hearing. And at the end of the hearings, they forced three professors, Professor Lucky, Professor Persinger, and Professor Hopped to, with, to, to resign from the, the board. One thing the board did do was to dismiss the charges against Miss Annis Chaikin who was the secretary of the Board of Regents at the time, and who, after her marriage, became the mother of Ted Sorensen, who has been honored by the University of Nebraska in virtually every conceivable fashion, and Phil Sorensen, a former lieutenant governor of the state of Nebraska. Well, in 1919, the Nebraska legislature enacted what is known as the Simon Act which prohibited instruction in any foreign language to any private, public, or parochial student except for foreign languages taught as academic subjects to students who had passed the eighth grade. Members of the Lutheran Church, members of the Catholic Church sued to enjoin the law because they feared it would make parents withdraw students from parochial schools and have a compulsory public education law only allowing only allowing public schools with no parochial schools. Oregon had done that. Oregon had done that just very recently, and in a, finally in a case entitled Pierce against the Society of Sisters, Oregon held that in fact states could not have a pu compulsory public education law. But in any event, these people brought an injunction. The district court refused to grant the injunction, and so did the Supreme Court when it was appealed to the Supreme Court. The court, however, narrowly construed the statute, saying that any complete prohibition of foreign 
language instruction was an unreasonable exercise of the police power and schools could not or could do, teach foreign language during recess periods or after school. Well, the parochial schools began to teach foreign languages, which they'd been doing all along. Two Zion Lutheran churches in Hamilton County did so. The county attorney in Hamilton County went out to the schools to see what was going on, and he found a teacher named Robert Meyer teaching elementary school, kids who had not yet made it through the eighth grade German, and he continued to do so as the county attorney watched. Uh, he was charged by the county attorney. He was convicted in county court of a violation of the statute. He was fined $25. He appealed to the district court. The conviction and the fine were upheld. He then appealed to the Nebraska Supreme Court, and the Nebraska Supreme Court ruled against him, upholding both the fine and the conviction. The court said that the legislature could reasonably conclude that immigrant children needed to learn English before being instructed in a foreign language. The law did not interfere with religious doctrine, which would have violated the Nebraska Constitution because the doctrine could be uh, taught in English. There was a very powerful dissent by Judge Charles Letton, who said that the legislature could not interfere with the fundamental right of every American parent to control, in a degree not harmful to the state, the education of his children. Meyer appealed to the Supreme Court of the United States. They decided it in 1923. The opinion, rather interestingly, was written by Justice James McReynolds. McReynolds was the biggest bigot, I think, ever to serve on the Supreme Court of Nebraska or of the United States. He hated blacks. He hated Jews. When Louis Brandeis was sworn in as a member of the Supreme Court of the United States, McReynolds turned his back and read a newspaper in open court during that during that uh, ceremony. They got back at him. Nobody from the Supreme Court attended his funeral. Um, <laughs> he may not have realized what had happened. In any event, McReynolds gave us a very interesting view of the 14th Amendment. He ruled that the state, that the statute in Nebraska exceeded the police power Mere knowledge of German was not unlawful. Parochial schools were already teaching English, and the statute did not in any way promote the claimed state interest of encouraging patriotism and the use of a common language. McReynolds said the 14th Amendment protects the right of the individual to acquire useful knowledge and generally to enjoy those privileges long recognized at common law as essential to the orderly pursuit of happiness by free men. McReynolds' opinion was the first instance of the U.S. Supreme Court protecting a non-economic interest against intrusion by a state, and it was, I think, obviously a precursor of the Gitlow decision, which came along just two years later, incorporating the 14th Amendment into the Bill of Rights, or the Bill of Rights into the 14th Amendment, I beg your pardon. The Wounded Knee Trials are something that we need to at least consider in passing. They took place here in Lincoln in many instances. They resulted uh, from the American Indian occupancy of Wounded Knee back in the 1970s. John has a, a very, very interesting book on, on the situation at Wounded Knee. The trials lasted for a year. Uh, they began in an atmosphere of tension and hatred. Um, the Indians refused to stand up when Judge Erbaum entered the courtroom. He didn't do anything to, to be critical to them. But by the end of the trial, Judge Erbaum's manner, his fairness, led the Indians to stand as he entered the courtroom, not as a gesture of respect to the United States of America, but as a gesture of respect to Judge Erbaum. The, f the fifth major case I want to talk about for just a little bit uh, is that of Irwin Charles, Charles Simons, who murdered six members of the Kelly family in Sutherland, Nebraska. Alan Peterson has already covered that, and Al, I, I'm not trying to tread on what you had to say at all. Uh, Simons molested some of the female corpses after he had shot them. It was a terrible event. It evoked a great public outcry. Television stations from Denver 
came on helicopters. And, and the whole issue arose as to whether or not Simans could possibly get a fair trial. He was arrested immediately after the killing. He confessed in writing both to members of the family and, and, and to the authorities. He was charged with the murders, and it then became apparent that there was going to be a conflict between the First Amendment right of the press to report what had transpired and the Sixth Amendment right of a fair trial as far as Simance was concerned. The case involved gag orders. The first gag order was entered by Judge Ron Ruff. Uh, he said, you can't say certain things in the media uh, that have happened in open court. Uh, he bound Simance over for trial of the district court. The media appealed uh, that order by, by asking to intervene in the district court. Um, judge Hugh Stewart, who was the judge in the district court, uh, <coughs> did away with Ruff's gag order, but entered a gag order of his own. Uh, and then the case became very, very complicated, swinging back and forth between the Supreme Court of Nebraska and the Supreme Court of the United States. Um, I won't go into all of it because we've already had a lecture that has discussed this in, in very considerable detail and very, very well. But ultimately, ultimately, the Nebraska Supreme Court heard the matter uh, knocked out all of the previous gag orders, entered a gag order of their own, said that the media had no right to intervene in a criminal case, that nobody has the right except the state and the defendant in a criminal case. And, and then the case went to the Supreme Court of the United States. They were asked to hear it expeditiously. They decided not to. Uh, Simance was tried and convicted and sentenced to death while the Supreme Court of the United States was considering uh, all, all of this information and then heard the case. And then the Supreme Court of the United States came down with its magisterial decision in uh, Nebraska Press Association versus Stewart, and they s held that there was no right to have the gag order. In in indeed, the Nebraska Supreme Court said Ruff had no jurisdiction to enter a gag order against the media and that they could have ignored it, basically. But in any event, the Supreme Court of the United States very, very strongly solidified the position that to have a prior restraint upon any publication, you, you bear a very, very heavy burden. There is a presumption. There is a presumption in favor of free press and free speech, and, and to restrain it before it actually takes place, uh, is, it, it takes a very, very heavy load. Uh, they didn't say that is, the right is absolute, which the Press Association had, had uh, tried to convince the court that uh, had happened, but in any event, it was a very, very significant uh, decision, uh, as, as Alan has told us, about the, the rights of the press. The last matter that I want to talk to you before I turn to the book, the last matter involved redistricting. You know, we have a census every 10 years, and we have to redistrict the legislature and the congressional districts and the Supreme Court districts and the Board of Regents districts. And if you have been following the newspapers at all, you know that we are having lots and lots of problems in the Nebraska legislature with the redistricting. They're giving Lincoln off at Air Force Base. Uh, Beatrice is going out into the third district. Columbus is coming into the first district. There was one effort to redistrict that split the city of Alliance right down the middle. Um, some, of these, some of these decisions have been ironed out, but it's, it's very sticky about what's going on. I don't know what they will ultimately do. They haven't decided it yet, and I would suspect very strongly, because the Democrats are screaming that this is a purely partisan gerrymandering, that they are going to file a lawsuit. So we'll see what happens. Maybe Amy Miller will be able to to do something in that regard, and, and we'll see what happens as far as redistricting. But this happened back in 1960. That's 51 years ago. The, the uh, voters, the, for, let me back up. In 1961, the legislature adopted a constitutional amendment and submitted it to the voters in 1962. They said county lines can be crossed in redistricting. You don't have to go county by county. You can cut through uh, Lancaster County. You can cut through Sarpy County. You can cut through Cass County. But in any event, it also allowed weight to be given 
as far as area was concerned. This was very dicey in view of the one man, one vote rule that the Supreme Court of the United States had imposed. The redistricting came out, gave, gave it to the uh, voters. They approved the amendment in 1962. They, it was challenged. It went into federal court and a three judge federal court. We have three judges in federal court cases where a question of constitutionality is raised. Uh, judge Harvey Johnson of Omaha, who is a judge of the Eighth Circuit, and judges, Judge Robert Van Pelt of Lincoln and Judge Richard Robinson of Omaha, held that the amendment which gave air, weight to area was unconstitutional. And they said the legislature has to fix it or, or they're going to have to run uh, at large in 1966. Well, the legislature didn't want to do that, so they came up with another uh, 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 another effort and the judges struck this down because there was a population disparity of 48 and a half percent between the largest district and the smallest district. And the judges said that won't work and we, they reminded them that if, it, if they didn't pass something that was legitimate, they were all going to run at large. Well, uh, people from Omaha aren't going to want to run at large <laughs> out in Hooker County. Uh, in any event, the legislature went to work and finally came up with something that said, okay, here's what we've got, and the population disparity is only 19 and a half percent. And so uh, the court, I think the federal court said, oh, hell with it, we're tired of messing around with this, and just said, okay, that's all right. 19 and a half percent won't work today. I'm quite confident of that. Well, I have tried to give you some indication of major cases that have talked about rights and liberties in Nebraska. Let's turn now to cases that were decided, and I'm using my own book. I have, oh, excuse me. Uh, I'm sorry, John gave it such a good plug. I do want to hasten to add that it's, it's for sale in the bookstore here on the first one. <laughs> so, so anybody who wants to get it afterwards, uh, I certainly encourage you to do so. You'll, you'll find that it's just awe-inspiring. But <laughs> in any event, in, let me tell you about some Nebraska cases. In 1968, uh, some people tried to kill the Nebraska income tax that had been passed in 1967 and they mounted an initiative campaign to eliminate the income tax. And that would have left the sales tax as virtually the only thing that funded state government because in 1966 we'd thrown out the property tax for state, state government purposes. The Secretary of State held that the group had not come up with a sufficient number of, of uh, petitions because some of them came in on the 5th of July, the, Election was scheduled on the 5th of November, and the statute said you had to have them in more than four months before it happened. Well, that's a, a pretty narrow construction of the statute, but in any event, the petitioners went into the Supreme or the district court here, and, and Judge William Hastings, later the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, said that he would grant a writ of mandamus to allow the election to continue. The case was appealed to the Supreme Court and it was advanced so that a decision could come down from the Supreme Court prior to the November 5th election. On October 21st, the court entered a per curiam opinion that affirmed the district court, and they said a written opinion will follow. Well, the election came and went, and voters did not throw out the income tax. Three days after the election, the Supreme Court came down with its opinion, and the Supreme Court opinion said, as this court said in State X Rail Errors versus, versus Amesbury, the amendment under consideration reserves to the people the right to act in the capacity of legislators. The presumption should be in favor of the validity and legality of their act. The law should be construed if possible so as to prevent absurdity and hardship and so as to favor public convenience. So the Supreme Court of Nebraska came down very strongly in favor of the right of initiative. If and this is just a guess on my part, if the people had voted not to retain the income tax, I think the opinion would have been different. I think the court reserved for itself a second bite at the apple. There were two dissents in the case that said you can't really stop the power of the state to tax 
uh, the power to tax is the power to destroy, all of that sort of talk. So I think the Supreme Court de deferred its opinion until they saw what the result of the election was, and then came out with the opinion saying, we believe very strongly in the initiative process. Uh, you bet they do. Uh, well, let's turn to another, another case in, in uh, State X. Rel. Douglas versus Bierman, uh, a district court had judged a legislative scheme of reimbursing poorly paid legislators for their expenses during the legislative session to be unconstitutional. The Supreme Court agreed to hear it. The matter came to the Supreme Court, and I, I think the Supreme Court was somewhat mindful of the fact that the legislature approves the budget of the Supreme Court and all of the <laughs> other court uh, systems in the court. And the court said, the language of the Constitution does not, does not forbid the payment of expenses. The court held the, that uh, the language that says, members of the legislature shall receive no pay nor perquisites other than said salary and expenses uh, meant only that salary was modified by said and it allowed the floodgates as far as expenses were concerned. Um, these are brilliant people. I mean, they, they know what they're, they're, they've all been to law school. Um, I, think, I think one of the most interesting, one of the most interesting cases was uh, a case called State X. Rel. Lebeds versus Bierman, which came down in 1988. And State Senator Bernice Lebeds uh, sued Alan Bierman, who was the Secretary of State, asking for a writ of mandamus to put an initiative measure calling for a state lottery on the ballot. Bierman had rejected the initiative petition because of inadequate signatures. Uh, the trial court refused to grant the writ, and Lebed's appealed, and the Supreme Court affirmed the refusal, saying that the Secretary of State's determination of the sufficiency of signatures is an administrative, not a judicial act, and so he did not have to give the petitioners notice of what was going on. Uh, I think it, it, it was an interesting uh, pullback from, from the language uh, uh, in the uh, tax case uh, about the power of the initiative. A case that was very interesting involved Walt Radcliffe. A lot of us know Walt, like him. He's a very, very good lobbyist before the legislature. Walt was tried criminally back in 1988. Uh, he was, I think at that time, certainly the most prominent lobbyist before the legislature. And he was criminally charged with hiring and paying petition or, uh, circulators to, to circulate a petition for a state lottery. The trial court sustained his motion uh, to quash the information on the grounds that it violated his First Amendment speech rights. Not the Third Amendment, the First Amendment. So he, uh, the, the state took exception to the, to the ruling and the, the uh, Supreme Court uh, agreed with the district court and, and so Walt is still with us today. Uh, with no difficulty whatsoever. Um, let's see. I've, where, where is my next case? Senator Chambers. Senator Chambers participated in this series and came down and, and talked one evening to a absolute overflow crowd. There were people all over the building listening to what he had to say. Uh, Senator Chambers is a dynamic and charismatic individual. He seldom, seldom did not get what he wanted uh, in the legislature. But I would like to tell you about one instance when he scored what I would think would be a Pyrrhic victory. Senator Chambers, this, this case was heard by Bill Hastings as the uh, Chief Justice under a, a special election statute that says only the Chief Justice hears some of these cases. Ernie was running for re-election to the unicameral and he received a certificate of nomination from the Secretary of State. And then the, the uh, candidate who was nominated for the U.S. Senate by the New Alliance Party, it was Bob Kerry, declined the nomination. And the, the New Alliance Party nominated Chambers as Kerry's substitute. Chambers accepted the nomination, 
Alan Bierman then issued an order saying, no, you cannot do that because you cannot appear on the ballot for the U.S. Senate and for the legislature at the same time. No person can be a candidate for two offices at the same time. And you didn't change your registration to the New Alliance Party. The case came before Judge Hastings. Judge Hastings was as good as Solomon in this particular case. He said, Senator Chambers can run for the Senate. We cannot mess with the qualifications for the U.S. Senate. And if he wants to run for the Senate, he's entitled to it. But we can say that you can't run for two races at the same time, and if so, if you decide to accept the Senate nomination, you cannot be a candidate for the legislature. I think Senator Chambers making the decision that he would much rather be in the legislature than go down in flames as the candidate of the new alliance party for the United States Senate decided that he would withdraw as a candidate for the U.S. Senate, ran and won for the U.S. legislature. Uh, just a couple of other cases and then I'll, I'll wrap this up. Um, I think that we have, we have protected people here in the United States, or in, in Nebraska, in a number of instances. Um, and and I'm, I'm proud of what uh, Nebraska has done in that regard. Um, in a case entitled City of Lincoln versus ABC Books, ABC Books was the bookstore that subsequently became Romantics and burned down this summer and uh, left a huge hole on O Street and screwed up traffic on O Street for almost uh, two or three months. There were open booths. Uh, there was an open booth ordinance adopted by the city of Lincoln that said you cannot have closed booths in a dirty, I'm sorry to the people at Romantics, but in a dirty bookstore. Um, you, you can't do that. You can't have these open booths uh, or these closed booths because there's a lot of hanky-panky that can go on in these closed bo booths. And ABC Books sued, uh, got to the Supreme Court in Nebraska. The Supreme Court in Nebraska said, uh, we're not really very concerned. We don't think you've got a First Amendment right of free speech to having a closed booth where people can engage in all sorts of nefarious conduct. <laughs> so that was a decision that I think made an awful lot of sense. Uh, here are a couple of others, and then I'll let you, uh, let you go, and, and you can ask any questions that you want to. The Nebraska Supreme Court disapproved of criminal prosecutions for adultery in Armistead versus State, 1955. Hall County had prosecuted one of its citizens for adultery. There was no direct proof of intercourse, lawful or otherwise, and the defendant was convict convicted solely on circumstantial evidence. On appeal, the Supreme Court reversed. They said, mere disposition and opportunity to commit adultery are not alone sufficient to justify a conviction, but there must be circumstances inconsistent with any other reasonable hypothesis. I am confident that many people that I know breathed a sigh of relief <laughs> when, that, when that decision came down. And finally, the last one I want to tell you about, a case entitled Vachik against Ames that was decided in 1985. The Supreme Court uh, rendered a decision that was really more keeping in, no, in a, accord with jurisprudential notions of 1915. A man named Vachik sued a man named Ames for alienation of affections and criminal conversation. Mrs. Vachik was Ames' secretary, and they had a rather warm relationship. Uh, they traveled together, and they admitted that they had engaged in adulterous conduct. And a jury gave Vachik a $100,000 award. The trial court found the damages to be excessive and granted a new trial on the issue of damages. He set aside the issue of criminal conversation, saying that such actions should not be considered criminal in modern-day Nebraska. The Supreme Court reversed, holding that $100,000 in damages for alienations were not excessive. Perhaps some members of the court knew Mrs. Mrs. Vachik, I honestly don't know. The court also reinstated the verdict for criminal conversation, which is a cause of action pertaining to a spouse's right to the exclusive privilege of sexual intercourse. The legislature took care of that. Since January 9, 1986, Nebraska law has provided that no action for alienation of affections or criminal conversation can be brought. 
there were three rather strong dissents in the case because criminal conversation was not a statutory crime. And our court has, on many, many instances, said we cannot have common law crimes in the state of Nebraska. Everything that is a crime has to be statutory. I think the dissent was probably uh, in better shape uh, in that case, and I think that case was really just a sport, just like Mr. Ames and Mrs. Vachey. <laughs> there are lots and lots of other instances in my book about how the court has protected rights and liberties. Um, it's not a bad book. I would, uh, if, if you, <laughs> I would encourage you to buy it and read it. But if I can answer any questions for you, I would be more than happy to do so. Okay. Thank you very much. We do have some questions. Oh, we do. I, I can't see it. 